Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today, my guest is Nigel Palmer, who is the author of the book, The Regenerative Grower's Guide to Garden Amendments, and an experimental gardener relying on the amazing complexity of nature to inspire his food-growing philosophies. He develops Curriculum 4 and instructs the gardening program at the Institute of Sustainable Nutrition. Welcome, Nigel. Oh, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Absolutely. So um, you had a book that came out last year, and I think we're going to talk about it in detail, but let's first talk about your background. You've had a very full career as an aerospace engineer. Talk to us about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was one of them. I was an aerospace engineer. I played one on TV from uh, nine to five and actually more hours than that. Uh, my primary job uh, throughout the years was solving complex uh, technical issues. Uh, and in that guise, I learned an awful lot about systems and mm -hmm. data and reviewing data and taking small amounts of data and trying to make something out of it, as well as uh, a st statistical analysis of data. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fun and I learned a lot and uh, that's past now. Yeah. Now, do you feel like you're able to use that training to kind of guide you as you started to dive into gardening and, and soil amendments and all of that? Oh, definitely. Uh, the, the engineer in me uh, reigns supreme. Um, I'm all about data. I'm always about trying to understand and uh, show with data why things work and how things work. And so absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. So talk to us about the garden. When did you start gardening? Well, uh, my family had gardens when, when I was very small. And uh, as, when I left home, I always had a garden. I've had a garden since I was in my early 20s, maybe even earlier than that. Um, and I always enjoyed having my fingers in the soil. There was something uh, very satisfying about it. And especially when working for a living, in an office environment um, that solace one gets from having bare feet and dirt under the nails uh -huh. is very reassuring and, and I don't know, just kind of nice, I guess is the easy way. The soil offers a, a great solace from uh, the hectic world around us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially being an engineer, I'm sure there's some stresses there that going back to the garden always helped relieve. <laughs> sure. So what point in your career of, of gardening did you realize um, there's a little more to this than just the general aspects and caused you to want to get involved in the nutrient dense growing? Yeah. Um, well, we decided to start growing enough food to last us for a year. And I don't mean all of our food, but specific crops. And, and in doing so, um, that required a little bit more of an understanding of what was going on. And in most soils, uh, if you're fortunate enough to live in a place like New England where the soil is fairly fertile, um, the soil was able to grow food quite readily. And then, you know, after some period of time, things didn't grow as well as they used to. And, mm -hmm. and we kind of, I think many of us just kind of wrote that off and just kept on going. Um, but there was a time maybe in our forties or something like that, that, um, geez, food got a little bit more complicated. The stuff in the grocery store wasn't as good as it used to be and all the processed food out there. And it's very clear that anybody's grown a tomato, that tomato grown in the garden takes a, tastes a hell of a lot better than the uh, tomato that you might buy in the grocery store, specifically in February. Mm. So taste was a, a first indicator of the, uh, the, the quality of food that we were growing at home. And, uh, and so, yeah, we started to recognize that growing our own food was a real health benefit. Um, and we took it off from there. So you were growing your own food for a year and you realized that, you know, if you wanted to do this, you obviously had to grow a lot of food and your garden wasn't producing as much as you wanted to. So then you started diving into the nutrients aspect of it. Were there any, you know, key nutrients that you realized from the start that were absolutely necessary 
or was it just more of, you know, added, trying to add, balance it as you went? Yeah. I think when we started out, it was more of, geez, well, you add manure to the soil and you turn it in and, mm -hmm. and things grow. I think uh, there's a, a saying, organic by neglect, that uh, rings true to many of us. And the idea of purchasing something in a store was never something that I'd even consider. Um, but yeah, it, I think that uh, um, I met John Kemp many years ago, and uh, he really turned my head to uh, the whole idea of, a, of an ecosystem in the soil and the minerals needed in the soil and where do you get them and how do you measure it and all of these kinds of things. And so I think those were real eye openers. Um, there wasn't any one mineral or uh, uh, specifically, but recognition that there are lots of minerals that are needed and your soil may or may not have them. And uh, a soil test is something that you might want to consider. Um, and once you've done a soil test, the, the first uh, comment to be made is, oh my gosh, my soil's terrible. Well, mm. By the way, things still grew there. So maybe that's not the whole story. Um, but sure, then you start talking about the uh, nutrition that's needed in the soil. And, and, and back in those days, uh, early on, I was like, well, geez, what do I do? And, and that brought along the idea of, of basically taking plants and putting them in a bucket of rainwater and letting them rot, thinking that, okay, this has got to be something that's, that's soil related. It's, it's all plants and plant matter. Um, and of course that stuff smells terribly, mm -hmm. but guess what? It's, there's something that felt right about it. There was an, an intuition that, that thought, yeah, okay, this is the right direction. And, and by the way, the plants didn't mind if it smelled badly. It was only me. Yeah. So putting the plants in there and um, so, so that was that. And then what was the, what do you feel like was the next step along your evolution or your journey? Yeah. I, I think the next step was realizing that um, people have been growing food for uh, thousands of years. And not only have they been growing it for thousands of years, many cultures have been growing the same food on the same land for a very long period of time. And the question is, well, how do they do it? And, and they're still growing high quality food. Uh, the nature of civilization is built around the quality of food that is grown for the masses. Um, you know, I mean, you look at the history of, of huge uh, successful civilizations and their rise and fall is, is fundamentally uh, couched in the quality of food that they grow. Mm -hmm. um, so it became clear that, okay, th there's, there might be new science, we might have some new understandings about going on, but the fundamental principles about growing food and good quality food has to be out there somewhere. And so the search for, um, I'll call it recipes and, and ways and, and, and how do uh, uh, cultures that have been doing this for so long do it? And, and what tools do they use? Because uh, you don't have to go back very far and, and you certainly weren't gonna buy these things in a store. Um, so the search for these sorts of informations and recipes was the next step. And finding, um, first book I found was uh, Natural Farming Agricultural Materials by Chao Yo, Jo Yang. Jo Young. And, and, and this was a, um, just a fantastic book for me. It was, it was an opening to some of the recipes that uh, cultures have been using for years. And when you start looking around, you can see that there are many cultures and they all have very similar uh, uh, recipes, I'll call it, ideas. They're all using the materials around them, the local materials, and either fermenting them or extracting them or using some means to convert these uh, uh, local materials into something that can uh, work in the garden. And these materials re range from plants to manures, even sometimes human manures, mm. in an effort to uh, uh, cultivate and, and produce high quality foods year after year. So it was, okay, so it's out there. And, and, and so how do I find these things? And then how do I um, actually do these things? Because you talk a lot about your amendment recipes where you do water extractions, vinegar, uh, fermented fish, um, obviously the IMO. Um, talk to us a little bit about, are there specific ones that are better, better for certain crops versus others? Sure. Um, you know, it's not so much certain crops and others, it's more time of year, uh, time of uh, uh, plant growth, uh, points of influence of those plants. 
Um, and what I'm finding in the analysis of some of these amendments is, um, um, first of all, different processes will produce different concentrations of minerals. And when I say that, uh, when you do a water extraction, you know, back when I was just taking plants and, and soaking them in water, I've done some analysis on some of those things. And sure enough, there's a broad spectrum of minerals in there, convincing me that those processes are really valuable and they really work. But the concentrations are much uh, lower than, for instance, if you use a leaf mold fermentation process that uh, Janam talks about. Um, and again, you're going to get a, a, a little bit higher concentration along with some other things that go along with the fermentation process. But it's the fermented plant juices that really provide the higher concentration of uh, mineral constituents in them. Um, and so the, the, the tools offer a broad spectrum of, of mineral concentrations as well as, sh as, well as shelf stableness. Um, it, a lot of the leaf mold products um, have various degrees of shelf stableness when you need to use them and, and how long it takes to actually get those minerals into a solution. Whereas the fermented plant juices uh, within a week, you can get really high concentrations of things that are shelf stable and have them available for you going forward. Same with vinegar extractions um, in a very relatively short period of time, more than a week, maybe uh, several weeks, uh, you can provide, you can create uh, an amendment that has high concentrations of very useful uh, minerals in them. So all of these tools, uh, not so much one or the other, all of them provide what I call a toolbox of mm. amendments. And so um, I use these things based on time of year, uh, based on plant specific growth phase and, and points of influence of that plant, um, as well as whatever the heck I've got on the shelf and available at, at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's dive into this a little bit deeper because we're talking about the, you know, the uh, extractions. So let's say um, we're looking for like some phosphorus. If you're looking for phosphorus, what, how would you approach, um, you know, sourcing the materials and finding the right extraction to kind of give the plant what they need? Yeah, uh, so phosphorus is very useful during the uh, flowering phase of a plant. And so if you have plants that are flowering, um, these, these are great things to consider using. In fact, um, I've had plants that are stuttering, I'll call it, uh, during the flowering phase. Uh, they they want to make those flowers. They begin to produce those flowers, but those flowers never develop. And so applying a phosphorus product as a foliar spray uh, during this time is, is a really great way to stimulate flowering. Uh, to answer your question directly, uh, if you look at the analysis of products that's not only in my book, but also on my webpage, uh, um, you'll see that shells, uh, oyster shells, egg shells, um, all of these things, and when you think about it intuitively, it makes total sense. These things have, uh, sorry, I misspoke, that's calcium. Um, the bones, it's the uh, cow bones and pig bones, uh, mammal bones that have high degrees of phosphorus in them. And so by using vinegar extractions, of um, uh, uh, cow bones, for instance, um, you can create solutions that have very, very high phosphorus content in them. And um, again, if you look at the data uh, that I've put out there, uh, you can see these high levels. It's actually listed in parts per million. And so I uh, provide foliar sprays of cow bones uh, or um, uh, pig bones, uh, any kind of mammal bones during the flowering phase of plants in order to stimulate that, uh, uh, that flowering process. Um, and we can go on, uh, for, uh, for instance, I mentioned calcium. Uh, during fruiting, uh, you really want that high calcium content. And that's when you'd use the oyster shell and egg cell vinegar extractions in uh -huh. conjunction with uh, a fermented plant juice, for instance, to get that broad spectrum mineral content as well um, to uh, stimulate the fruit filling phase of a plant. And then also when you start considering uh, and understanding the phloem and xylem flow of a plant and how minerals are distributed using those different flows, now you can really start getting sophisticated in your approach to either drenching or foliar spraying, depending on um, uh, which minerals you're trying to get into the plant. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. So then let's talk a little bit about foliar spraying. What time of day to do it? Do you have a specific um, tool you like to use to apply it? Yeah. 
Well, uh, um, the uh, before the sun comes up is the is the standard uh, answer to when best to foliar spray. Uh, the idea is you want the foliar spray to stay on the leaf for as long as possible, so it has an opportunity to absorb. And in those early morning hours, there's the dew uh, on that plant, and so it's going to stay wet, uh, uh, damp uh, for a longer period of time. And the foliar spray, that very fine atomized spray. Uh, will land on the leaf and stay there for as long as possible. Um, I also like the foliar spray when it's uh, foggy, uh, okay. or when it's cloudy, uh, a light drizzle at the end of a light drizzle. So anytime you have these moist conditions, um, actually uh, high humidity situations actually increases the uh, absorption characteristics of foliar spray. So you, 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 everybody knows a little bit about their surrounding. And if you're a gardener farmer, you know a lot about what's going on out there. So those times when the, uh, the foliar spray is gonna last on the leaf for as long a period of time as possible are the best times to foliar spray. Um, mm. You can foliar spray in the evening. I've done that successfully uh, and gotten good results. Um, the, the issue with the evening is uh, you'd like to have the plant, uh, as, uh, the plant leaf as dry as possible for as long as possible. So for those plants that are sensitive to moisture, um, foliar spraying in the evening will um, keep that moisture uh, level of the leaf on there longer, and that might um, facilitate pathogens that uh, may land on the leaf. And if your plant isn't healthy enough and doesn't have that strong lipid layer uh, on that leaf surface, uh, that's an opportunity for pathogens to take hold. Um, so once you start considering and understanding all these things, then uh, foliar spraying and when to foliar spray uh, comes uh, pretty clearly. I think the most important thing is to do it. That's it. I mean, plants need these minerals and if they're not getting it from the soil solution through the xylem flow, then, um, and, and if it's cloudy, for instance, oh my gosh, we've had some pretty significant rain here. We've had 22 inches of rain where I am in the last couple of months and we've had some many cloudy days. So, um, you know, thinking about that moisture and, and, and the rain and things like that, are, are paramount uh, when considering foliar spray. Okay. So, all right. So you use foliar spray. Now the, let's say you go back to this vinegar extraction you're doing with the, like the limestone or the eggshells or the um, seashells. Now with that oyster shells, now are, how long is that running before you can start using the, the product? Uh, I'm not quite sure you, what you mean by running. Oh, like how long does it have to ferment or have oh. to sit in solution? Sure, sure. So vinegar extractions, you want to leave them for um, um, a fair bit of time. Uh, normally what I do is I make a vinegar extraction and I always label it. I put a, put a piece of tape on the jar and I, I write the date down and, and what's in it. Um, and, and then I go away. And, and oftentimes I just plain old forget about it. And then yeah. I come back sometime later and, oh yeah, it's, it's been long enough. Um, I don't know. It, 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 it depends. It doesn't take long for vinegar extractions to take place. I mean, whereas fermented plant juices take a week or so, um, you might want to wait a few weeks. Uh, okay. Yep. And with that too, is there any advantages of using like organic vinegar versus like regular apple cider vinegar? Yeah. Um, uh, or that's a great question. Organic is, uh, is something that we talk about a lot and the value of organic in our country, based on the 700 odd page definition that uh, is put out by our government, um, the benefit of organic from my position is that it reduces the probability of having GMOs or uh, pesticides, herbicides, mm. fungicides included in it. So um, I always select organic products um, in, in these sorts of processes just to reduce that probability. Um, having said that, uh, one of the best things you can do is make your own vinegar. Uh, one of mm. the keys is to do that, and, and it's very simple to make vinegar. Uh, you can, there's a lot of apple trees around that are essentially abandoned, especially in our part of the world. And uh, just grabbing those apples and cutting them up and throwing them in a crock and adding some rainwater. And again, go away for a few months and come back and a mother will have formed on the top. And you can use pH paper to measure the acidity of it. And once that pH gets uh, in the four or five range, uh, you pretty well have apple cider vinegar. Um, so yeah, you can make your own or, or you can purchase organic apple cider vinegar for the purpose of extracting 
uh, minerals from just about anything, whether it's bones or shells mm -hmm. or people. It's really fun because as I've started talking to people about um, uh, resources and using local, um, people are really come to the table with their own local stories. And uh, for instance, somebody might uh, do a lot of bird hunting or they might raise chickens or things like that. And all of a sudden they've got this wonderful supply of feathers. Okay. Well, so if I use vinegar to extract the minerals from feathers, what kind of a product am I going to get? Mm. And this is the value of doing the analysis that I mentioned earlier to mm -hmm. find out what's exactly in these things. And then utilizing the, uh, the components, the mineral components of these products. Uh, what about hair? Um, I've talked to people that uh, have sheep, for instance, and they end up with some extra sheep hair at the end of uh, um, taking the wool. Uh, geez, there's a resource. And what about most of us that have hair that actually grows? Mm -hmm. uh, and we cut it. Um, geez, what about that? Is there, is there a value in those resources? So the, the idea of vinegar extraction extends itself, not just to the recipe in the book, but the process itself. And this is one of the things that I'm trying to put together and, and share with people is that there are processes, there are tools. This book is a toolbox of different, not only processes and recipes, but also models that you can use to try and understand as well as measuring tools so that you can actually measure the efficacy of these things. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so then you were measuring that, finding out more information about that. Um, now, diluting this, how do you, do you have a standard dilution you do, or is that going to come down to testing? So fundamental dilution rates start at about 500 or, or 1,000 to 1, depending on okay. what you're using. Um, and, and that makes small amounts go a long way. Um, and then if, if you're really interested, uh, you, either you can actually observe the changes in the, in the plant or the, whatever it might be as a result of applying these things. But you can also measure it uh, by using a refractometer and measuring the refractive index of the plant leaves of the plant after uh, these different products are applied. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, now, one of the things that we planted here was a bunch of comfrey. Do you use comfrey in some of your extracts? Yeah, definitely. Comfrey uh, makes a, a wonderful uh, amendment product. Um, you can both, you can just soak it in water and make a water extraction. You can use uh, leaf mold. You can use fermented uh, 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 organic brown sugar and make fermented plant juices. Yeah, uh, comfrey is a great one. Awesome. Yeah, we've been meaning to uh, do some, we, we, we've got a plant, it, it's looking great. We haven't done anything with it though. So one of these days I'll get around to it and yeah. I have enough, I probably could do a 50, 50 gallon drum or something of it. Yeah, then we probably could actually make a foliar spray and sell it into our gardeners that we work with. That'd be really cool. All right, so talk to us a little bit about um, refractimer, refractometers. Um, so you use that for some measuring. Um, do you have a particular one that you like or um, just the general ones out there work well? Yeah. So uh, the, refract the refractometer is a, is a very useful tool. It's, it's kind of a crude tool and uh, many people poo-poo it uh, because of the sources of variation uh, that uh, come into play when using it. But when used in a consistent manner, um, it provides a relatively cheap tool that just about any of us can use um, in measuring either the quality of the fruits and vegetables that come into your home um, or measuring the, uh, the efficacy of some of the amendments that uh, we're talking about here. So let's talk about uh, just measuring the refractive index of the fruits and vegetables that you bring into your home. Um, this is a great way to evaluate uh, the stuff that you're buying in the store. If you want to compare uh, farm A, farm B, CSAA, CSAB, um, by going and getting the tomato, let's say again, and measuring the refractometer, measuring the refractive index of the tomatoes that you purchase at various locations. Um, taste is a great indicator, but the refractometer gives a number that you can actually write down on a piece of paper to compare. And, and I use this to determine where I want to go buy um, fruits and vegetables um, if I'm not growing them myself. Relative to measuring the efficacy of uh, these amendments, uh, it's quite simple to measure the refractive index of, uh, let's say, a half a dozen plants, uh, let's say blueberries, for instance, and you measure the, uh, uh, the refractive index of the blueberry leaf, measure, pick, pick the same blueberry 
leaf each time, for instance, the third uh, blueberry leaf from the top, and measure the refractive index of, uh, of a half a dozen uh, leaves or of uh, several plants, and, uh, and then go ahead and apply an amendment. And then come back a couple hours later or the next morning or something like that, or both, and determine whether or not the refractive index of that leaf increased or decreased. And mm. those are going, that, that indication is going to tell you whether or not the plant liked what you applied to it or didn't like what you applied to it. And so gotcha. this, this is a way that you can actually use this simple tool to evaluate the efficacy of what you're doing. And then you can goof around with concentration levels. You can goof around with mixtures. You can goof around with different plant juices, uh, blah, 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 ad nauseum. In order to understand what's going on. So again, it's a tool in the toolbox that is very simple, very cheap, uh, and can be used to evaluate what's going on. Relative to a specific refractometer, the most important thing is to buy one that is in the appropriate range. And for most of the plants and vegetables that we're talking about, you want to have a refractometer in the range of zero to about 35. And that's a pretty common device. And Last time I looked, you can pick one up for $35 or something like that online. Uh -huh. They sell them for a lot more than that, uh, but I, I would just go for the cheapest one you can. And perhaps the only characteristic other than the range is to make sure that it's uh, temperature compensated. Uh, the oh. index of uh, uh, juices, plant juices will change based on temperature. And so a temp temperature compensation device uh, would be useful. Uh-huh. That's, that's a really good thing to think about now. Cause I was thinking you probably want to make sure you're testing at the exact same time every day, because I know the sugars and plants can go throughout the day. Correct. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, in fact, one of the things that I've always enjoyed doing is picking a specific plant and actually measuring the refractive index of that third leaf down at two hour intervals for during the day. I highly recommend that for something to do for those of us that are just plain old curious. And to your point, you ought to see the refractive index increase during the day as photosynthesis kicks in, mm -hmm. is able to generate all those sugars, and then reduce, get lower at the end of the day. And um, uh, you'll find that if it does not, if it's flat, that's an indication of a boron deficiency in your, in your soil and your plant. Oh, that's a good tip right there. Did you hear that, folks? If there is a boron deficiency you will not see a rise in the, uh, the bricks during the day. That's a really good tip right there. Um, so that's one of the things to think about is obviously, you know, we do annual soil tests here, but we're always trying to get more and more information from our plants. Um, you know, for someone who's, you know, just starting their garden, what are some things that they should just always be looking for? Jeez, uh, I think that the most valuable thing to put in a garden is your foot. Mm. Uh, I've heard many people say that in the past and, and I think it's really true. When you go out into the garden and you start being aware of what's going on and you look at that plant every day, um, you're gonna see what's going on. If it's not growing, there might be an issue. If it's just staring at you and, and isn't doing anything, something's up. Um, uh, you'll also see insect pressure if there is insect pressure and some of those insect pressures you can actually deal with manually. Um, so I, I think being out in the garden and observing is really important. We talked about a refractometer as a way to measure the, uh, uh, the sugar content of the plant. And as the sugar content of the plant increases, what you're doing is you're developing its immune, its health system. And as uh, the refractive index increases in plants, the ability of insects to uh, bother that plant decreases. Uh, once you get a refractive index above 12 or 14, insects will no longer bother the plant at all. And in fact, by looking at the insects that are actually um, bothering your plant, you get a good indication of what the refractive index is in general. Um, uh, insects have a hierarchy of, uh, of what they will eat. Um, and so you can determine that. Okay, let's break that down a little bit more. So you basically you're saying there's like cucumber beetles. Let's say when do they go after plants? What what kind of rate do you see them at? Yeah. So um, as the as the sophistication of the eating of the insect get, uh, increases, the bricks of the plant increases. When you're when you're talking about beetles and grasshoppers and things that actually are chewing plants and mm. chowing them down, um, 
that means you're, you've got a refractive index in the 10 to 11, 12 range, and you've got to get a little bit higher to get rid of those guys. Uh, the aphids and things like that, those are going to bother plants in the lower ranges in the sevens and the eights. For instance. Ah, gotcha. Okay. All right. That's, that's very interesting to know. Yeah. This spring we had an outbreak of aphids in our squash and I've never seen that before, yeah. but um, that probably means that we were really super low. So what you do, this is, this is the pull point here. What we recognize is foliar spraying has the ability to provide nutrient to the plant very, very quickly. Uh -huh. When we apply, apply rock dust, for instance, to the soil in the fall, it takes a long period of time for that rock dust to get digested by the soil ecosystem, get uh -huh. the soil solution, and then get absorbed through the roots into the xylem flow of the plant. Whereas when you foliar spray, you're applying that foliar spray directly to the plant and giving it the nutrition it needs to increase that sugar content. And so as soon as I see any kind of insect pressure, boom. Now's the time to foliar spray with broad spectrum mineral amendments, such as uh, fermented plant use of, of nettle or dandelion or something. Uh -huh. like that. So you're giving the plant the nutrition it needs to increase that sugar content and thwart those insects uh, in the short term. Okay. So when you're, let's say you just mentioned nettle and, and, and dandelion, are you growing those? Or are you just wild harvesting those? Yes. Um, I, I have, I, my garden's full of dandelions and, and my garden's full of stinging nettle. I have stinging nettle patches all over the place. Uh, not only do I use it for fermented plant juices, but um, mm. it's one of the healthiest foods available uh, in the garden. Um, it's just, it's a multivitamin of choice. Uh, um, geez, I know people that have survived uh, on stinging nettle um, just because of its high nutrient content. And it also mm. has a wonderful network of root structures that really fertilizes and, and breaks up the top layers of the soil. Uh, when we talk about quote unquote weeds and cover crops, uh, a combination of stinging nettle on the top surface and some of the deep taproot uh, weeds like uh, the docks or dandelions or parsnips, parsnips are a great uh, uh, plant as well. Um, so what you wanna do is you wanna affect the stratus of the soil. Um, so by having different weeds on your soil, um, you're actually affecting different levels of those soils. So um, yeah, and dandelions, all parts of a dandelion are edible. Um, in the fall, we'll harvest the roots uh, and, and make a, a, a for, for dandelion root tea. In the springtime, we'll eat the, the young greens. Uh, we'll eat the, we'll make um, dumplings out of the flowers when they just come out. Um, mm. so all of these things are not only good for the soil and the plants, but they're good for us. And, and that's an amazing thing is once you start understanding that the soil is an ecosystem and you understand that you are an ecosystem. I mean, when you start recognizing the varieties and numbers of bacteria and viruses and uh, that are in your body, you quickly recognize you're an ecosystem too. And one of the most astonishing things that we learn is, as, as we teach in the Institute of Sustainable Nutrition, the, the garden portion of the program, as well as the, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the science of nutrition and, and kitchen medicine, what we recognize is there's not a lot of difference between the digestive system of the plant, aka the soil ecosystem, uh -huh. and our digestive system. And again, this brings us back to this holistic idea of that we're all ecosystems and, and there's not a lot of difference. I mean, there's some nuances of it all, but uh, we need a strong digestive system and a healthy gut in order to be healthy ourselves and the plants the same way. It needs a strong digestive system, aka a soil biology or a gut in order to maintain its health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, this is fascinating stuff. And I think you mentioned before we actually got on that the book is now in its fourth printing, that it's been worldwide. Yeah. Yeah, it's been about for a year. And before a year was up, it was in its third printing. And the fourth printing is, is, is either happening now or just about to happen. So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's been pretty successful uh, in, around the world. Awesome. So when people read the book, what's the most common question that they turn around and like write in or email in to you? Uh, geez, I get, I get all kinds of questions. I don't know if there's one specific one, but one common one is where do I start? Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of a common one. And it's one I like to talk about because, um, you know, some people claim that they're beginners. Some people claim that they're very experienced. But no matter what the situation, we're all neophytes, I think, when it comes to understanding the soil and understanding the relationship between soil and plants. So um, my comment is you start by doing something. Um, 
make a move even if it's the wrong one kind of thing. Mm. And I think as we experiment, as we do things, as we document what we're doing, as we uh, do something year after year, it's, it, that's how we learn. And it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. Um, it's a matter of learning and growing with it. And uh, these sorts of uh, undertakings are lifelong processes. Um, the, one of the things about this book is that you can read it today and you can go and do all kinds of stuff. You can come back, read it five years later, and you're going to learn more. You're going to, more ideas are going to come at you and more understandings of, of what's really going on and more experimentations will come your way. So I, 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 one question I get is, well, where do I start? And, and the, the answer I say is anywhere, uh, just do something. Um, and recognize that this is a toolbox and that there are uh, many aspects of, uh, of, of running a garden. And having a plant model in your mind, having an understanding of, of what's going on with which to make decisions is really important. So it's having a model, it's understanding what the tools are, uh, but most importantly, it's doing something. Because, geez, as I said, as I started, when I was 20 years old and had my first garden, we grew some really good food and I didn't know any of this stuff. So it's really not a question of, of, of being the best or doing the best or growing the best. It's just a matter of doing it. Just get out there and do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with that, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back shortly with Nigel. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here with another kind of chat with Molly from Harvest Host. Molly, let's just talk the big picture. Why, you know, why was Harvest Host dreamed up? How did it come about? And why is it so, in, that's so important for, for right now? You know, it's a great question because I think it's just evolved so much over time. So I'm kind of just going to highlight on really what's going on now. You know, I think I think specifically in the pandemic, you know, we had a lot of people move to road travel, um, people more comfortable on the road, um, working from home, kind of made people more mobile. And so the Harvest Host platform became even more important to people, not only for the interest of seeing the nation on the road, but also safety. And with that, we were able to connect our membership to more host locations, you know, and we were able to bring in, I think, it was around $20 million in 2020 of additional revenue to these host locations, farms, mm -hmm. wineries, breweries, um, alpaca farms, you know, and being able to hopefully save some of these small businesses. So I think, you know, as Harvest Host looks towards the future, we just continue to work towards building partnerships with these small businesses to help them move forward and bring this additional revenue come in. And it's just our favorite part really of connecting our membership to um, the locations. And I think back to the statistics, I think in 2021, this year alone, we're estimating about 40 million back to small, yeah. small businesses. So it's just been a really rewarding business model um, alongside of just looking at our host locations and saying, it's not hopefully a huge lift to you to host, you know, these members overnight, but look at the value and look at the relationship that comes from it. Absolutely. And I think on the farmer's side, you know, most of us that listen to this podcast are in the regenerative agriculture world, which means that we really believe in what we do and why we farm. And we want to share that with people. And so what better way to share that is to actually get people on your farm, trying your products, walking the fields, or if, however you want to kind of direct them around your farm and what you want to do. But what better way than just have a constant stream of people coming throughout the seasons to check it out and, you know, learn about why farming like this is so important. So I think it's a great opportunity as well as, you know, share that the beautiful land you've been in steward with. So absolutely. And I, I really do think it's increased the appreciation for farming, which is honestly mm -hmm. something that just really blows our mind that we've just been so disconnected from. And so it's bringing people back. It's bringing them back to the understanding of where things come from and the respect needed on the farming side and really the revenue back to farmers so they can keep going, you know, so it's, it's really a special model and we're really just grateful to be a part of it. Absolutely. And we are back with Nigel talking all about soil and uh, making it work for you and making it have healthier vegetables and more nutrient dense vegetables. Um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, your, your book is a toolbox for anyone can use to improve the health and diversity of an ecosystem. How is that book laid out? Like what's, when we get started, what are we going to learn? And then kind of, how does it go from there? Sure. Um, well, when I first decided to write it, I wanted to put forth a recipe book. It was clear to me that it took me really a long time to 
not under not only understand the, some of the concepts going on, but uh, to actually put these recipes in a form that were really easy to do and. And I call it kitchen chemistry. You, you know, you need a sieve and a ball jar and, a, uh -huh. and water and, and you can do this stuff. So um, it originally started as a recipe book. Um, after I wrote it, I realized that it needed context uh, for a normal person to understand why they were doing these things. So the book is essentially laid out in two parts. And the first part is more of a philosophical discussion about uh, the soil plant interface um, specifically talking about a plant model. I think models are extremely important. Um, we use models to interpret the world around us, whether or not we realize it or not. And many of the models that people use for agriculture are um, not necessarily well thought out or concise, that maybe is a good word. And so I try and lay out a model within which you can use to make decisions. So once you understand the concept of the soil uh, plant ecosystem and the symbiotic relationship between them and uh, some of the aspects of phloem and xylem flow, then decisions about what you're gonna do and mm -hmm. how to do it and when to do that become a little bit clearer. And so it gives the reader the opportunity to say, well, why am I doing this? And oh, yes, this is why I'm doing it because I'm going to facilitate this aspect of uh, this ecosystem. So the first book is really talking about a philosophical approach. Well, it became clear to me that the tools needed to uh, determine uh, efficacy and, uh, um, and understanding the data associated with what's actually in these things were, were equally important. And so that's why I really delved into the idea of a refractometer and what kind of things you can do with a refractometer not only measuring the quality of the fruits and vegetables that come into your home so that you can compare what's going on uh, with the things you buy, but also so you can determine uh, the efficacy of the products you're using and gauge the increase in productivity um, of the plants and vegetables that you're growing around your home. And then finally, the engineer in me really got the best of me. I can't remember when this happened, but at some point I was making these amendments and I had a shelf full of these things and I was using them and I suddenly thought to myself, okay, I recognize that uh, uh, minerals of various proportions are important and needed. And depending on what book you read and what era, you need 17 or 16 or 18 different minerals in certain proportions. Well, what's in these amendments? And so I started looking for ways to actually analyze these things. And I came up with a, a, a unifying, uniform way of doing it to eliminate sources of variation and so I included that in the book as well. So the book is really laid out as a toolbox so that anybody can read through it and get to this place where they have the understanding to actually make the amendments, the understanding of why they're using the amendments, and the understanding of how to measure their efficacy. And essentially, it's a starter book for just about anybody to get you to some level where you can start either doing a PhD thesis on these subjects or just work in your own garden and, and using your own garden notebook to understand um, how to do these things and move forward essentially without purchasing things in a store. There's no reason to go to the store and buy any of those things on the shelf that are a lot of times extremely toxic, not only for yourself, but the environment. Um, and so I, I really wanted to put something together that was empowering for an individual, for anybody to become their own experimental gardener and take advantage of that canvas that we're provided at the beginning of every year and paint a whole new picture from the learnings that from year on year on year on uh, using these tools. Very cool. Um, so when's the audio book coming out? Uh, I don't know. You'd have to talk to Chelsea Green. <laughs> I think there's a Kindle. There's a Kindle. Yes. Yeah. It's just never the same, but I mean, you have the, a great voice. That'd be great to read it too. So um, yeah, just sticking a sound booth for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so write Chelsea Green a note. <laughs> yeah, I should. I should mention it to them um, because I mean, the problem is with, you know, being a full-time farmer, it's very tough to have the time to, you know, sit down and read a book. Um, and obviously, you know, there's illustrations and stuff, which are important, but I, what I usually typically do is I'll first listen to the book 
And then I'll go back and look at the physical version of it. And if I need to look at illustrations or something, that's what I'll typically do. Well, if you look at the, if you do open this book and, and you look yeah. at the recipes, it's loaded with pictures. Yeah, it's very extensive. I'm just, I'm blown away by how much is in there. So let's talk a little bit about the education you do, because you have the book, but then you have the Institute of Sustainable Nutrition, and you guys do classes and all sorts of stuff. Talk to us a little bit about how that all works. Yeah. Um, so the Institute of Sustainable Nutrition was a school that uh, Joan Palmer put together, my wife. Um, she's about 10 years now. And she had been teaching at uh, various uh, higher level institutions um, she still teaches uh, the art of eating and um, uh, classes at uh, master's degree level and uh, university levels. Um, but after some time, uh, she, the one university asked her, well, what do you want to do next? And she said, well, geez, I think I'd like to start a school. Um, she has degrees in human nutrition and education. And her experience with nutritional degrees was that they were very lacking. Um, some of them were very clinical. Some of them were very, uh, and had that very degrees of strength, but none of them really brought together the whole idea of food, of, of real food discussions, a complete discussion of real foods. Um, why, is, why is eating food so difficult? Why is it so difficult to figure out what to eat? And what is all these diets out there? And, and, and all of these people claiming that this is the only way to eat and things like this. Um, and she recognized that not only was there an aspect of the science of nutrition that was really important, but there was also the aspect of cooking and how to cook and make the bone broths and the sauerkrauts and, and some of the really healthy foods that are out there uh, that feed the gut, uh, but also the idea of uh, kitchen medicine, the idea of, well, what did people do two, 300 years ago? How did people maintain health? When you got sick 200 years ago, what did you do? Uh, uh, you, uh, that elderberry elixir for, for viruses and colds, for instance, uh, was, was key and, and on many shelves. And, and so where is that learning? And, so, and then finally, she recognized that the food that we eat is fundamental and the food we eat is based on the soil. And we always say, well, you are what you eat. Well, I always say, you are what your plants eat. You, mm. you're, you are what the soil is all about. Absolutely. And in fact, we know civilization uh, two, three hundred years ago, your health was largely dictated by the land around you, which the food you ate was grown from. And, and that's the way it was. Your health was pretty well dictated by the land around you. And so what she did is she took all of these aspects and created this Institute of Sustainable Nutrition. And uh, for the last 10 years, this was a, 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 an extremely uh, um, enlightening program that was all hands-on, in-person, and very, very small classes. And uh, um, the people that have gone through it, uh, uh, I, I can't tell you how the, the amazing comments we've gotten from it. Anyway, when she was starting off early on, she recognized that she needed a garden portion of the program. And mm. she asked me if I, uh, if I'd do that. And so I said, sure, I'll do it. And we thought it originally that the garden portion would be like a couple of classes. By the way, it's a year long program. Um, and uh, um, so we thought that it would only take a couple of the classes. Well, it, very, it became very clear very early on that this was really fundamental to uh, uh, nutrition. And it turned out to be part of the whole year program. And then, as I said earlier, the similarities between the human body and the relationship between the soil and plants just came over and over, repeating itself over and over. And we, we, you know, I'd be teaching my thing and she'd be teaching her thing. And some of the other teachers were teaching and all of a sudden we'd stare at each other and it's like, Hey, wait a minute, this is the same thing going on here. And so it's become a, a, a really um, holistic conversation. And, and again, it reminds us that the, the ecosystem, your body is an ecosystem. As I said before, the soil is an ecosystem. We live in an ecosystem and there's this this lovely co-mingling of life uh, that we're all involved with. And, and it just brings out this, this, this wonderfulness of, of the world we live in. Um, yeah, so um, now we've moved to uh, COVID times and uh, the program got shot, shut down for a year uh, because of all of the stuff going on. And so we've begun to 
uh, offer some online things. And uh, in fact, uh, I'm offering an online program uh, uh, about uh, these gardening topics that's, that's available. And we're, we're just firing up again with the Institute of Sustainable Nutrition this year. We're actually going to uh, have a program this year. It's going to be very small. It's going to be in person, but we're offering uh, some Zoom characteristics uh, associated with it. Um, and we're, we're slowly moving in a direction where we can uh, uh, reach more and more people. Yeah. Yeah. You need to get that information out um, digitally. Yeah. It's important. But, you know, I, th I think the one thing you said there about being in person is I feel like being in person, being on site, being together in a small group just has such a better uh, learning aspect to it. There's just such, so different. I totally agree with you. Yeah. The other thing that happens is, uh, and this was also something that we really didn't anticipate when we started was the, the community that is built. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so many people come from backgrounds where uh, processed food is the norm and uh, real food and these understanding these topics that we're talking about are foreign to still a very large portion of the population. And many people felt ostracized in, in islands when they left the school learning environment and went back home to try and uh, uh, associate these ideas either in the family environment or with friends. And mm -hmm. so the community that's been built associated with these things is really just fantastic. Yeah, to support the other people around them. I, one of the best education experiences I had was a 10-day workshop um, with um, Darren Doherty of the Regrarians up in Vermont. And uh, we was, it was 10 days intensive. We stayed on site. It was like morning till night. Um, and at the end of the 10 days, you're like, oh my gosh, we couldn't take any more. But it was such a, I still remember that so well with it, being able to not only learn from Darren, but also just like working with the other uh, people there and just learning from them. Um, it was an incredible experience. So yeah, that in-person aspect is really cool. But you also have the, I think I'm on your website here and you've got the five classes that's starting at the end, middle or end of October, which looks really good as well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, I, off, I began offering a, a garden program and uh, um, it, it's offered again. It's coming up. Uh, uh, you can register now uh, for that October. I think there's five Saturdays uh, mm -hmm. in October and November. And in that program, we really focus on these ideas of a plant model and talk about these amendments, talk about uh, these models, specifically xylem and phloem flow. And once you begin to understand these flows and, and the circulation in the plant, then applying these amendments becomes more uh, of, a, uh, of a meaningful task. Um, and we, we also talk about many other uh, subjects. And again, there's, this is an opportunity for people to um, have a lot of discussion time and talk about these ideas and, uh, um, and benefit from um, these ideas. And I think this gets people off to a really good start uh, to become experimental gardeners and farmers themselves. Awesome. So what are your favorite tools for doing this? I know we talked refractometer, you talked mason jar, anything else that people need to put in their toolkit to get started? Um, I think my favorite tools are my hands. Mm and having them in the soil. Um, I think that, and my eyes and my nose and my ears, I think just being aware of what goes on in the garden and the soil is, is just so mind bendingly cool. Um, every time I go out and I look around, I see different things. I see different uh, insects. I see different uh, pollinators. I see different frogs, snakes, toads. Um, doing different things. Um, and the interrelationship between all these things in the garden is, is just wonderful. I, I think going out with eyes open um, is just such a, a, a beneficial thing for us all. It's just plain old healthy. Most of us have removed ourselves so far from the reality of nature, the reality of the real world, I'll call it. And, and just being in the garden gives one pause from concrete, tar, beige walls, um, and, and some of the other fake uh, 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 things in our society that um, most of us are far too well aware of, whether mm -hmm. it's TV, whether it's a, an iPhone, what, you know, whatever it is. Um, the garden just offers a great respite 
and, and, and relief from those things. So I think that the most important tool in the garden is yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, you know, that, that phrase, you know, footsteps of the farmer is the best medicine. I absolutely believe that. Yeah. And it's the, the, and I think a lot of the times it's the beds or the fields closest to where we get to all the time that actually produce the best crops mm -hmm. because they get the best management. They also get intention. Yes. When we talk about energy, um, we talk about intention and we talk about our ability to shape the world around us. And so I think that, uh, that, that comes into play as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So do you have a favorite crop to grow? Yeah, I got to think garlic is my favorite. I've, I've enjoyed growing garlic for, I don't even uh -huh. know, decades now. Um, and I grow an awful lot of it. I used to grow 800 bulbs a year for personal use. Um, That's a lot. <laughs> I'm down to about 500 now and I'm, I'm, I'm ratcheting up again. It doesn't seem to be enough. But garlic is not only a wicked healthy food, um, it's really easy to grow. And one of the cool things about garlic is you're planting it in October. And there aren't many of the crops that uh, a standard fair gardener might plant. And planting in October is, is kind of neat. Um, and so when April comes around and it pops up and it's all ready to go, it's, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm, all, I'm ahead of the game here. Um, uh -huh. We could talk for a long time about the health benefits of garlic. But also, um, I use this, the garlic that's left over um, and simmer it on the stove, um, and I use that as a repellent for mammals um, and some uh, insects and slugs and things like that. And I found it extremely effective uh, at thwarting raccoons, bears, um, maybe even voles and uh, things like that. Uh, so I think garlic gives uh, a, just not only a health benefit, uh, but also an all-around uh, gardening experience benefit. Absolutely. Now, when you, when the garlic starts waking up, do you use a specific um, treatment for it or do you spray anything specific on it? Well, again, it's what I have, but um, let's, let's talk spring. Okay. Let's see. Let's think. Mm -hmm. about it. Okay. So springtime comes up. Well, the soil is really cold. Um, in fact, um, I go and pick out, I, I, I mulch my garlic pretty heavily with leaves, crushed leaves. And so I go and open up the furrow um, and, and make sure that that little noodle of garlic can pop through that thick set of leaves. And sometimes I actually can feel that the, the soil is still frozen. Um, mm. um, I live uh, uh, above a thousand feet and I, I'm in a zone five environment. So things are pretty cold up here uh, for Southern New England. But nonetheless, I recognize that the soil is cold and the biology in the soil when it's in the 40s is pretty sluggish. Uh, I measure the soil temperature every morning in several locations around here. So I'm pretty aware of what's going on temperature wise. And so, so you got this thing, it's growing, it's got a little green noodle, it's growing, but so how can I facilitate that growth? Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to provide an amendment that has uh, nitrogen in it, for instance. And so um, a fermented fish I, uh, uh, has some high nitrogen in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Fermented plants have uh, a good amount of nitrogen water fermented plants, leaf mold fermented plants have good nitrogen in it. So I might steer towards some of these amendments that have the nitrogen in it um, in plant available forms. And I might apply that as a foliar spray um, early on in the spring to try and facilitate those early growths. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you know, one of the problems we have, and I was mentioning before we got on with our strawberries is um, they like garlic wake up so early, the, the soil isn't woken up completely. And so right. we, you know, try to hit them with a heavy dose of nitrogen to get them going. But then what happens is we over, well, then the soil biology kicks in and then you end up getting too much nitrogen total. Um, any thoughts on that? Or, um, do you think we're just need to, you know, dial back that initial nitrogen punch? Well, so the nitrogen that you're going to provide the plant in a fermented plant juice or in a leaf mold uh, fermentation product is going to be different than the nitrogen you purchase in the store. Yeah. And we're using like a Chilean nitrate. So it's, you know, it's organically approved, but it's a very, I'd say conventional form of nitrogen. Exactly. And so how does that nitrogen actually get to the plant? Well, it's got to get into the solution. You've got to get it into the soil. It still needs uh -huh. to be digested and go through the root system and into the xylem flow. When you're foliar spraying with a fermented plant juice, you're using the phloem flow. And uh -huh. you're getting that right onto the plant so it can use it immediately. One of the problems with having the nitrogen in the soil 
is the plant recognizes that there's nitrogen in the soil and it may not bother facilitating the symbiotic relationship with the biology in the soil that's fixing nitrogen because it's uh -huh. already there. And so you're kind of short circuiting the whole reality yeah. of this whole plant symbiotic relationship. And so maybe the other thing to do is to consider using a foliar spray of real uh, nitrogen uh -huh. available forms, but also in conjunction with that, provide the soil with leaf mold biology or IMO4. So you're uh -huh, uh -huh. facilitating the biological aspects of the soil at that time, uh, as well as providing the nitrogen through the phloem flow, which maybe isn't tricking the plant so badly. Uh -huh. uh, I like to make f uh, leaf mold biology as early as I can in the spring. And once I've made that leaf mold biology, I have biology that is accustomed to those temperatures. So uh -huh. I'll make my leaf mold biology outside in the same place that I'm going to apply it. And so I'll take that leaf mold biology and I'll apply it to the soil. Now what I'm doing is I'm applying biology to the soil that's ubiquitous and representative of what's going on, but it's also in the temperature range of what's going on as well. And so that biology is gonna take hold in the soil um, and, and may facilitate the development of those nitrogen fixing biologies a little faster than if you did nothing at all. Certainly, I would think, at least in my opinion, more so than implying a, a raw form of nitrogen that is just not, it's not in the ecosystem. The, no, that doesn't happen in an ecosystem. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Now, that's really interesting how you've got, yeah, I like that. Um, have you done anything with prebiotics? at all playing with it. I would assume that would probably be, you know, something along the line of the IM, IMFs, IMOs, but um, we've been using a product called Ultra, which has got like 240 strains or 400 strains of bacteria in it. And we've seen a huge jump in our yields off of that. Um, and just the, the much better tilt to the soil. Right. So leaf mold biology is, you can't beat it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've read that or are familiar with Jadam and some of these conversations, but I highly recommend that you read the leaf mold biology recipe in the book. What mm -hmm. you're doing is you're capturing the local biology and, um, and making it available to the soil. So when we talk about 200 varieties or 50 varieties of this and that and the other thing, what we're talking about when you're capturing leaf mold biology from the local woods or something like that, you're getting thousands you're getting, you don't even know how much, Never mind bacteria, but you're getting fungi, you're getting archaea, you're getting a smorgasbord of everything that's available right there. Mm -hmm. And so when you go and purchase something that has 200 and something, something's in it, well, a lot of times it's in a dormant form. A lot of times it's from some other place on earth. And who knows if that's the stuff that's going to even take within the environment that you're actually using it in. So when you make your own leaf mold biology, you're, you're, it's it, it's real, it's there, it's now, and it is a smorgasbord. You can't even count the numbers mm. of different types of fungus, archaea, and bacteria that are in it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Now talk to me about your guys that are, and I promise this is the last question, that are starting to scale this up because obviously we talked, you know, Mar mason jar size, but let's talk about, you know, five gallon bucket, five gallon drum. Um, are guys starting to scale that up to do this on larger acreage? Oh yeah, definitely. There's a lot of that stuff going on. And, and I'm having the luxury of talking to people around the world that are, after, that are trying to do that. And um, uh, the gold standard in, in this kind of conversation in, in around here is a guy by the name of Brian O'Hara. Mm -hmm. He's also got a book out there, No-Tell Intensive Vegetable Culture. And he's doing this stuff on a, a small farm scale um, and producing very, very high quality food as well. Um, and, and that's the whole point. Everything in this book is scalable. Um, I, I tell people to do a quart jars because that's something that uh, mm -hmm. a normal guy in the kitchen can stand and do. You can mm -hmm. use 50 gallon drums. You can use 500 gallon drums. You can go to any scale you want. And everything that we're talking about here is scalable. The whole conversation, the biology, the model, the tools, everything is scalable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, yeah, we, pro um, we have 275 gallon drums or the, the cubes, which would be really nice to do that in. Um, that'd be a good scale. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you'll find, I, I think you'll find the same kinds of results. And, and again, it's just so empowering to be using these things in your own backyard um, <clears throat> and not have to go to a store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Nigel, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a fascinating interview. I'll probably have to have you come back and talk just garlic for an hour. That could be a fun conversation. <laughs> um, but I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. It was a pleasure dealing with this subject and, and a pleasure having the opportunity to, um, to be with you today. Absolutely. Hey, Thriving Farmers, have you checked us out on YouTube lately? We have a bunch of new content there, including a few rants by me. I uh, want to tell you, you don't want to miss them. Um, I actually go rant about you know some of the problems I see in our space and some of the challenges I see farmers uh, facing. So go check that out. We've got instructional videos over there as well. Talk about setting up our new farm here in Ohio and all the steps we're going to do that, as well as just tutorials and tips on best practices for all all sorts of things on the farm. So go ahead, check over at Growing Farmers on YouTube and see the new content we put together for you. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.